it seemed like funny and gimmicky, but now it's like scary. It's very scary. That is really cool. At the risk of seeming like more of a psychopath than you already think I am, I'd like to claim responsibility for building this thing. Why? Because it's freaking cool. Look at this thing. What other explanation could you want? Automated airsoft turret that sits on your desk and can track any person that comes into the frame. You can usually only get this type of thing in like a Call of Duty kill streak. I just built this thing in my garage. I'm not sure how this would hold up in court, but I did it because a YouTuber told me to. Which YouTuber you might be asking? Well, earlier I was at work. I get a phone call from Tyler Blanchard. Luckily I was wearing my adult diaper today because, I don't know, I just had a feeling I would need it and man, it came in handy. So he calls me with an interesting idea. He said, hey, I know you're a world-class robotics engineer. I wanna give Airac the world's best security system. Is there any way you could make me a robotic turret? Obviously I'm the clear choice for something high-tech like this because I've built stuff like a bunk bed here that goes 35 miles an hour. Um, also a mobility scooter that goes 35 miles an hour. And stuff like this, a machine that launches tires. A little bit faster than 35 miles an hour. Oh, and not to mention the giant pizza cutter that's sitting in his best friend's living room. I'm never gonna get over that. I'm sorry, I'm just not. So because of these very weird things that I've built on my channel that really don't have a lot to do with my profession, people probably don't know that I'm a robotics engineer, but I am. So I said, of course I can do it. Um, and that's when he dropped this bombshell on me, which is that I only have five days to do it. Five days to do something I've never done before. And I'm an idiot, so of course I said yes. I have limited experience with Python. I have limited experience with OpenCV. I really have just basically like read about it at this point. And here I am promising Tyler the moon and I'm sitting here holding a, a paper airplane. I don't know if this project was the best idea, to be honest, but I was up for the challenge. So that's where we are. At this point, I just really hope that I can pull it off. I really, really hope that I can do it. If you hear some noise in the background, it's uh, 3D printers going feverishly because of what I'm about to talk about. Obviously, this thing has to have a name, so I call it the Automated Sentry System, or ASS. Oh, that's an oversight. Essentially, you've got two axes. You've got your pitch and your yaw. The base is gonna rotate and then it's going to go up and down to be able to track the target. Um, to track the target, we've got a camera right there. So that's our basic plan. It is a one-man show over here. I think they have a lot more confidence in me than I do. I've got a couple days and I'm gonna see if I can make it happen. I started by making a mechanical design in CAD software, and I was sending stuff back and forth with Tyler and his team. I was mostly talking to Tyler's production manager, Willie, and he's actually a computer science major, so honestly, without him and his skill set, this project might not have happened. It probably wouldn't have happened. So shout out to you, Willie. You're the best. Once I was done with the initial mechanical design, I put most of the parts into my 3D slicer. That's the software that takes the model of what you designed in the CAD software and makes it readable in machine code for the 3D printer. And this gave me the estimated print time for the full machine. And I was not prepared for the amount of time that it said it was gonna take. It takes a really long time to 3D print things. Each layer is only 0.2 millimeters. And basically, if everything went right, none of the prints failed, it would take over three days just to print the parts that I needed. Now, the other variable was that Willie had just barely shipped me this airsoft gun, so I wasn't even gonna get this until two days after I had started the project. Somehow, I'm supposed to make a mechanical design off of that. So fueled with just caffeine and a prayer, I took my best guess at the dimensions and sent it to the printer. All right, so I know you're bored. You don't want to listen to this nerd explain all this dumb stuff. Look, some of you guys have the attention span of a pickle, so I'm just gonna summarize this for you. Thanks, TikTok. Day one, the mechanical design went great. Day two, 3D printing, fantastic. Day three, 3D printing went amazing. Day four, catastrophe, total loss. My last piece, the biggest piece, it was gonna take 18 hours, Woo! failed after a couple hours in. I restarted it and it failed again. And guess what that means? I'm out of time. This isn't happening anymore. Not gonna happen. I don't have enough time to print it. I called William Tyler and I'm like, guys, I don't know what to do in this situation. I've spent all this time printing, everything's gone great, and then all of a sudden it just fell apart in the space of a few hours. And that's when Tyler told me that if I didn't pull this out, I was dead to him. I'm just kidding, they believed in me so much more than I believed in myself. They were saying stuff like, Garrick, you're awesome, you know stuff. But now I had to figure out how to build this thing out of stuff that's not 3D printed material, completely change the mechanical design, and build it in one day. But hey, I've already dumped four days into this thing, so what's another? 
So I just got back from the store. Uh, I got this little Lazy Susan attachment. That thing fell off the printer last night. This one honestly isn't turning out very good because it's coming up from the print bed. We're gonna put some bigger motors on it, some bigger servos, and I'm gonna change to this setup so that I can do it more quickly. I'm gonna use extruded aluminum and I'm basically gonna rebuild the frame around itself. It'll be a little bit heavier, but Hopefully with the stronger servos, they're about twice as strong as the ones I have now. Everything will just work, hopefully. We will see, we have uh, basically one day from now to get this thing shipped out to make the video. So, um, wish me luck, I'm gonna build it. I had a lazy Susan and a dream. I was gonna make this thing happen. So with nothing more than a few vague measurements written down in a hand-drawn sketch, I started cutting apart the aluminum and making the new frame. Not all of the 3D printing was in vain because I ended up using some of the 3D printed brackets, like what holds the airsoft rifle and the blocks that went on either side with the bearings and the motor. I integrated those into the aluminum frame and kind of built the frame around those. And then miraculously, somehow I pulled it off. Somehow by midnight that night, I had already completely rebuilt the frame out of the aluminum and the polycarbonate and had a semi-functional model going. At this point, I had completely changed the design and got the mechanical side of it completely done in one day. This is how the software basically works if you never worked with software before. When I say OpenCV, that's a vision library, and that's essentially the eyes of the machine. It tells me what's going on from the camera, and I can talk to that using my Python program. Python is a pretty common programming language. That's what like my main program or the brain of the operation is, is Python. I use that Python program to tell a device called an Arduino, which is a microcontroller, it's essentially a small computer, where to move the motors so that it can point the turret at the target. And those are little motors that they call servos or RCs servos. The motors can aim the airsoft turret anywhere the program tells it to. OpenCV can see the target, tells my program where the target is. My program sends that data to the Arduino. The Arduino tells the motors where to move. The motors move to that spot and then another motor pulls the trigger. Super simple, right? Well, not exactly. I used a couple of 15 kilogram servo motors to make a mock-up of the two axis setup that I was going to use. So I channeled my inner Michael Reeves and put a laser on it. So with this really simple zip tied together model, I was able to get it to track me. It was still a little bit rough, but it was working. So I plugged everything in. I had kind of a test program that I'd written in the Arduino that basically was just going to go back and forth, make sure that I could hit the points that I wanted to hit. It was so much better than I thought it would be. And I was ecstatic to see that it was actually strong enough to move the rifle around in exactly the way I needed it to. I sent Tyler's team an update. They were obviously super excited. So up to this point, I kind of thought I had the software worked out. The problem was I had a little tiny Michael Reeves set up with no weight on it and just kind of throwing a laser around, but it's a big difference when you have a lot of weight behind the servos. Now, the model I had been using previously was a person tracking model. The problem was is the way that I'm calculating where the servos should be aiming is I'm taking the box width and then the box height and I'm calculating the center off that and that's where I'm commanding the servos to go to. But when testing it in a couple different environments, the person detection model that I was using ended up picking up random things in the room that weren't actually people. And that's not really helpful when you want the vision system to be tracking people because it's a security system. And with those models and my limited knowledge of of Python, I wasn't really able to figure out how to make that stop. And now I have this thing fully physically built. And then the software side of it that I thought I had figured out is just completely failing me. And then I'm frantically searching around on the internet for different models I can use in OpenCV that are maybe a little bit more stable or what kind of confidence factors can I use. And I was really just having a super hard time. Then I tried a model that was using just face tracking and that seemed to work. It wasn't exactly what I wanted when I was starting, but at the very least, it's not tracking a random toolbox. I knew that I had a physically really strong machine. I knew that the software was tracking people, and I knew that the trigger mechanism was working. I'm just gonna sneak over here. So I went to bed at 4.30, woke up at 6.30, got in the car, and headed 45 minutes to the nearest UPS store to overnight ship this thing. Yes, I actually live in the middle of nowhere. And when I got to the UPS store, the workers there told me that it was the second weirdest thing that they've ever seen shipped. We arranged all the details, they were gonna pack it up for me, and then when she got me all rung up, my jaw absolutely hit the floor. She told me the total to overnight ship this package, which keep in mind was only 24 pounds, was $1,455.99. Bruh. 
In my mind, this was the end of the project. I was like, I don't care who you are. You are not paying $1,400 to ship a piece of garbage that some idiot in Idaho built for your YouTube video. That's not how it works. Yeah, YouTubers make good money. Not $1,400 to ship garbage across state lines money. That's more than most people's rent. Maybe not in California. So I called and I called and I called different people and I just couldn't get a hold of anybody. And it's probably pretty dumb on my part, but I just swiped my card and was like, they told me to ship it, I'm gonna ship it, cried on the inside, and drove back to work feeling completely sick to my stomach. Now, by the time I was almost back, I guess people were waking up in California and I was starting to get phone calls. The first one was from Tyler, who I called like 10 times. He's probably waking up looking at his phone wondering who died. So I shipped it, but the, the cheapest one was like 500. The slowest one, the cheapest for that size oh, of package. Shit. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. No. Well, work. so it wasn't. It wasn't 500. I did the one that Willie told me to. It was almost 1500 for the. 1500. Like 1500. Yeah. yeah 1455. Oh god. Okay. Um. I mean, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. I would talk to uh, to Willie. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to get it sorted out. Uh, dude, I appreciate you bringing it there though and uh, dropping it off. You're you're a legend. Yeah. No. Thank. Thank you. Yeah. I'll talk to Willie about it. Don't worry about it. All right. Peace. All right. He was pretty chill about it, but I knew he wasn't super happy about the amount, as well he shouldn't be. Then, right after I got off the phone with him, Willie called me, who had, I had also called him like 10 times. <sighs> call from Willie. Hello? Oh, I just saw I missed a bunch of your calls. Shipping go well? Um, so yeah, I sent it. The one that you said that you wanted was 15. 15 dollars or? No, it, it was 1,500 dollars. <laughs> For hundred dollars to ship the package to get it tomorrow. Yeah. Oh my. Oh, um, oh, uh, I don't know if that was what you're expecting, but I mean, it definitely, like, I, oh, I was expecting like around five. Um, uh, let me, can I call you back in like, like 10 or 15 minutes? Uh, I'm going to have to figure this, this out real quick. Fifteen hundred dollars to ship it. Yeah. Yep. I missed your call, so that's that's definitely my fault. <laughs> um, yeah, let me let me let me call Tyler. I'll call you back in like 15 minutes. Okay, sounds good, man. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Bye, brother. So he ended up calling them and canceling it, making sure that I got my refund. And then he sent me another label from an online third party that did it a ton cheaper. It ended up being like 250 bucks, a like little bit of a difference. And I was feeling good. I knew the thing worked. I knew it was out of my hands. So I thought on its way down to California. So the next day when it got there, Willie FaceTimed me to get some help setting it up. And he was FaceTiming me from the location of where they were actually gonna do the video. And that place was none other than the house of Arak. I was looking in the background, seeing my pizza cutter that I built in my shed here in Idaho, seeing my automated turret that I had just built and set down there sitting in Arak's living room, and watching Arak and Tyler and all their team walk past. I talked to Arak on FaceTime, told me how much he loved the pizza cutter. It was all just a really cool experience for me. Like, I don't feel like I have any right to be interacting with as many extremely talented and popular people that I am. But this is where another huge colossal mistake that I made is exposed. In order to get this thing working, I switched over to face detection. It was the only way that I could get it working. I originally told them that I was gonna do person detection. So they planned the video around person detection. And it was at this point that I had to tell them that I switched to face detection and why I did it. They understood why, but when they tested it with the face mask that they had, even though it was a clear plastic face mask, when people had it on, it was too much of a glare for the face detection to work, especially at a distance. I mean, we're talking about like 30 feet. So at this point, me and Willie were kind of going into panic mode because this thing that they've spent so much money and so much effort to bring in for the video was in all likelihood not gonna work. And this is where Willie really came in clutch. He was a huge help because we went back and forth for hours trying out different models and having him suggest different things that we tried and we got close, but we never really got anything that was working reliably. Everything was trying to detect other things in the room and we were having a really hard time actually making progress. And that's when I found a model that I hadn't really looked at before that was tracking me so reliably that even when I put a blanket over my head and body, it still tracked me. It still knew I was a person. It was only tracking one thing in the frame. It wasn't jumping around to a ton of different things. It was super reliable, super quick. We even ended up having to slow it down just to take a little bit of jitter out of the motors. So it was only actually processing every two frames. I was finally making progress. And when I thought this thing was completely out of my hand, 
plans and done. I had actually screwed it up, but now the night before what was going to be the shoot, they probably think I'm an idiot at this point, but we have a working machine. And with that, I put my full trust in them that they were gonna take care of everything else. My part in this project was done and I was honestly so relieved to be at that point. This project honestly challenged me at every moment. I don't think I've ever been so sleep deprived in my life. There was a point that I realized I hadn't eaten for like 30 hours, but I'm so happy that I was able to pull this out. I want to say a big thank you to Tyler for giving me this opportunity in the first place. And if you made it this far watching the video, you obviously liked it. And if you're not subscribed, subscribe. It's free. See you in the next one.